Hello, and welcome to WCAT. I'm Kiki Latimer, and I'm your host for the Catholic Bookworm. And I'm uh, pleased to have with me today uh, Dr. Mary Ruth Hackett. And um, we're going to be discussing her wonderful new book, Daughter by Design. Um, but before we get completely started, I'm going to have uh, Mary Ruth begin us with prayer. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, yeah, let's start in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Gracious and loving God, we thank you for this opportunity to come together and to talk about um, daughtership and fatherhood, the love that you have for us. Lord, we thank you for all the listeners. We ask that you open their hearts and the minds to hear exactly what you have intended for them to hear today. And Lord, we thank you for WCAT and all the good work that it does. We ask all this through the intercession of our Blessed Mother. Amen. In the name of the mm -hmm. Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Thank you. Thank you for having me, Kiki. I'm really happy to be able to come on and to um, talk about the book today and a little bit about um, our role as God's beloved daughters. Well, it's a wonderful title. I enjoyed the book. It's very interesting. Unfortunately, I had to read it quickly rather than sort of work through it like a workbook, mm -hmm. which is more intended for almost like a, a home retreat. Yes. Um, yes. But um, I loved it. So tell us a little bit to start off about the book. Well, like you said, it really is uh, sort of a mini retreat or like a self-study to help the reader to really discover her herself, what's special about her, what's uniquely beautiful about her, and then to help her understand her purpose each day and to give her sort of the tools and the strengths and the awareness to give her the ability to live with more purpose um, and to find more fulfillment in her life and in that intimate relationship with God the Father. Daughter by Design was really written to help women to understand how and why we were created uniquely, individually, to love and be loved by our Heavenly Father. The book itself is divided into three parts with three chapters in each section. So there are nine chapters in total. And um, I share stories. Um, I pull from a lot of other um, much wiser um, saints and um, priests and religious sisters. And then I interfuse um, the developmental science in it. My background is, a, is developmental psychology, specifically educational psychology. And so I pull a little bit from the science and psychology of um, women's identity development. So I, I start um, by helping the reader to more clearly understand her identity as a woman, uniquely, not just generally as a woman, um, although I talk about that also, but what are what are your unique gifts, your strengths, your weaknesses? And then together through the book, uh, we look closely at the challenges to holiness in the section, second section. Um, what are some personal struggles? What are some big crosses and little crosses that, that we deal with through life? Um, because that can really be a challenge to us in our relationship with the Lord. And then um, I walk the reader through the process of really understanding how and uh, where we need to grow. And then that last section, we look at kind of the practical personal prayer life and how we can grow there as well. So, um, yeah, that I, I guess I think that pretty much wraps it up. <laughs> You're right, so you, though. It's a book that you sit with. It's not a book that you read um, start to finish. Although it's funny, I had one of my, one of the priests that I know wrote one of the endorsements for it. And he read it cover to cover first, and then he sat down, and then he took another week, and he just took a week with it, and and really worked through it himself. And he was he was so sweet when he sent me uh, his endorsement. He said, "I read it twice. I had to read it twice because the first time I just had to absorb it all, and the second time I had to grow through it." So it it really is a book that um, <laughs> it should take some time to read through. It works great as a group study also. I just got an order for a, 50, a, a box of 50 um, from a parish because they're going to do it as a parish study for their women's group. Okay, that's a great idea. My hope is, of course, I was reading it on my computer screen, so I'm hoping when I get the, the hard copy 
to yeah. go back to it. Um, maybe during Advent, it might make a nice Advent re retreat. It really would. It really would because, and the, the sections are small enough, they're digestible enough. When I was first envisioning the book, my thought was it's got to be some, I mean, we're so busy, right? I've got four kids. We are so um, busy. Right. I mean, I've got four kids. I got a podcast. I'm, I'm trying to write. I'm trying to do speaking engagements. Like how much time do we really have to sit and think about ourselves? I mean, most right. of us don't take the time to do that. And so what I wanted was a book that really broke things down, that engaged the reader right away and that people could see the practical applications in their life as soon as they open the book. And so each chapter is broken into smaller sections with reflection questions. So you can read a couple pages, then you work through some reflection questions. And if you need to close it and stick it in your glove box and, you know, do the pickup line at school or run to run kids to a soccer match, you can do that. And then you can pick it up later that night. You can read another small section before bed, look at the reflection questions, pray on them as you're falling asleep, look at them again in the morning. It's, it's that sort of a book. I like that you said you wanted to make it small enough to fit in your pocketbook yes. or in your coat pocket. I thought that was a really great idea. Yeah, I mean, I've, got, <laughs> I've got some big books and it's like, I look and I'm like, this book just doesn't, it doesn't fit where I need to take it and I want to take it, but. Great. I have some monster sized books sent to me and I've been involved in writing a few, but they're not the kind of book you could throw in your purse. Yes. Um, or, you know. So before we even open this book, though, you have this fascinating title, Daughter by Design. Mm. Um, talk about that. <laughs> you know, we are designed intentionally. And I, I wanted the title to reflect that. And, and we're designed individually and uniquely. And I think sometimes as women, we get really good at... Um, I, you know, I think the theological phrase is dying to self and, to, and, and, and to, to sort of putting other people's needs first. And that is certainly a beautiful, wonderful, and holy way to grow um, in virtue. But, you know, we've also heard the term mommy martyr, right? <laughs> <laughs> that um, a better <laughs> option is to really be able to look at the way we were created and what our gifts and what our strengths are and what our weaknesses are. And then be able to use all of those for God's glory. And it looks different for each one of us. And so in order to really understand how we're supposed to live out our purpose, we have to come to a, a better understanding of ourselves. We really kind of have to know ourselves a little better. Uh, there, uh, years ago, there was a, a Julia Roberts movie called The Runaway Bride. And in the movie, one of the, she was being interviewed by this reporter because she had a tendency to get engaged. She was a serial monogamous. She would get engaged to these men and then she would leave them at the altar. And she had done this repeatedly. And so this reporter found out, so he was going to do a story on her. And one of the questions that he asked each of the men that she had left at the altar was, how does she like her eggs? And each man responded the way, they like their eggs. You would say, oh, she likes them scrambled just like me. Oh, she likes them poached just like me. Oh, she likes them fried just like me. Oh, she doesn't like eggs. Neither do I. And the, the main character was changing herself to just fit that circumstance, changing herself to fit that relationship. And that's why she was never able to say, I do. Because she never knew what she had to give to that relationship. And, and I, that, that movie has stayed with, I mean, it's an old movie, probably from the 90s. It has stayed with me for, for all these years that I've studied identity development. Because if you don't know who you are, then you don't know how you can live in the world. And of course, who you are is a lot more than how you want your eggs, right? <clears throat> but that's a very surface level understanding of who you are and if you don't even know how you like your eggs then it's really it, then you you really got a problem in terms of understanding yourself on the deeper levels probably well it's diff it's difficult also because we do live in relationship we live you know yep. we we start out you know in a, in a family where we're the daughter you know then we're the girlfriend we're the wife we're the mother we're the grandmother 
So mm -hmm. our roles change. Um, and it's interesting. My husband will often say, I can tell who you're talking to on the phone by your tone of voice and what you say, because you're almost a different person with each person that you're with. So on, on one level, that's a normal thing. On the other, there's got to be this deeper core <clears throat> you that travels exactly. through these relationships so that you know who you are in each of these relationships. And Not that's that you're the making yourself up. That's the daughter. That's the daughter. That, yeah. that is the you who stays. That's, that's, that's the unchangeable you. Obviously, we grow and we change throughout life, and we should. Um, I'd be a really poor developmental psychologist if I didn't recognize that. But we were, we were created as a daughter, and we are going to die as a daughter. That's the only unchangeable um, role that we will have. And, and there's something just so beautiful and intimate in that, because when we can see ourselves as a daughter, then we can get a glimpse of seeing how God sees us. And that is beautiful. It is beautiful. And, you know, as humans, we hate change. Generally speaking, we don't like change, which is why I tell people we're headed for this eternal changelessness. Mm -hmm. um, but tapping into that changelessness, um, the sooner the better, <laughs> if you can find that those deeper those deeper um, roots that we have. Um, you know, when we're in a plane, we always hear put the oxygen mask on yourself first. Um, but often in life, we do forget about that. We're taking care of, like you say, we're taking care of children, grandchildren. I have an elderly friend I'm helping take care of um, who sort of lives with my daughter. Um, so I, like you, I'm a very busy person. <laughs> um, and... I do have to remember to take care of me, um, to get to my yoga class, to spend time with my best friend. Um, I have to do that so that I stay healthy um, and balanced. And, you know, I have to get myself usually to daily mass. I didn't get there this morning because I was coughing. But, um, you know, to do the things that I need to do. But as women, especially as women, I mean, Anne Mora Lindbergh talked about, you know, women men have a sort of usually a, a, a particular job, you know, they go to work and they do this one thing, but women are more like the, you know, the spokes of the wheel. We, you know, we're much more relational. Um, so we, we pour ourselves out in like 15 different directions. Um, so we do, our, and it, our, it, it's that our, relationship with our father that will then feed us and feed those relationships. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and keep us from being depleted um, and give us the awareness when we need to slow down and when we need to say no and when we need to adjust. And if we can stay connected as a daughter to our father in relationship, then that's how we find what we need in life to feed all of these other relationships. And all the rest of it. Yeah. You, know, you you talked about the um, us being in relationship and and, and I just I, I want to go back to that a minute because I, I don't want anyone listening to this to think that I'm suggesting that that we shouldn't put others um, wants and needs um, ahead of ours in times that we shouldn't live selflessly we absolutely should but if we don't recognize that we're even doing it um, then that's very different than offering it as a gift. We're supposed to be offering those things as a gift, but if we don't even know what we're giving, then that that takes away a bit from that that pure and intentional offering. Then then we're just letting people strip things away from us without right. um, making it a gift, and it, it should be a gift of self. And if you don't know what's in the box, then that's not a very good gift. <laughs> yeah. And one of the themes you started with in the book was the concept of being a perfectionist, that some of us desire this perfectionist thing, uh, which, of course, is always unattainable, but it also leads to things that aren't good. Yes, absolutely. I, I am a recovered or recovering <laughs> perfectionist. Perfectionism is, is not something that everybody struggles with. Um, 
<clears throat> but it, it really can undermine relationships with others and it can strip away our own under, our own self-worth really. Um, the way we look at each other, it's associated with all sorts of negative um, uh, mental health and physical health uh, correlates. So uh, it's just in general, just not good for you to be a perfectionist. Um, but it, it really does pre prevent us um, from living from living with hum real humility. And I think it's something that in some ways we value perfectionism as a culture, a secular culture. And there's not an awareness of, of, of how really damaging it can be to people, to individuals, and to relationships and families. Well, it does. You mentioned it leads to judgment more than mercy. Judgment of ourselves and judgment of others. Well, there's right instead of mercy, yeah. um, which I, I thought that was very interesting. Um, and instead of perfectionism, you talk about integrity. Mm. So how does integrity differ from perfectionism? Well, I mean, that's a beautiful word. Yeah, when you're living with integrity, you're living with, um, you know, there, there, there are two different ways of looking at integrity. One is looking at it as uh, moral and uprightness. And the other way of looking at it is this wholeness. Um, and when, when you're living a life of integrity, you're looking at all the aspects of yourself and, um, and, and, and how you can do you know, justice in a sense um, for those those gifts that you have, but also with an awareness of your weaknesses. Um, and so, when you're living with integrity or with wholeness, it it makes it easier to live um, with integrity in terms of moral uprightness. Um, does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah. Um, one of the things I liked was the word um, under it that where you were writing, where you talked about persevering. Um, hanging in there both with yourself and with other people. And I think when it comes to relationships, um, persevering is one of the biggest, the most difficult things that we do. You know, persevering in a marriage, persevering in friendships, hanging in there when your toddlers become teenagers, mm. um, persevering with God, um, persevering through, you know, disappointments, um, through also through parish relationships, how, how you interact in your church community. Um, there's a lot of persevering to be done. Um, and that comes through this integrity. Yes. And I think sometimes in our secular world, we focus more on uh, the, the buzzword of self-care in terms of perseverance. And we try to escape any, anything that's difficult We'll say, well, no, I'm not going to do that because it makes me uncomfortable. I know my, my husband had a, he's brilliant. I, he's just, he's great. Um, and we were discussing something that we were struggling with at, at one point with um, a social situation. And he said, we can't be the reason a relationship fails. And that just stuck with me so much because he was right. When things are difficult, sometimes it's easier to say, let's just not go. Let's just not deal with it. Let's just, uh, just remove ourselves from the situation. But sometimes that means we're the reason why things f fall apart. Um, and sometimes we are asked to, usually we're asked to persevere through it. If, mm. unless God is really clear with us that it is something that we need to remove ourselves from frequently when it's um, a relationship or a relational thing we're asked to persevere through it we're asked to endure some suffering and to endure it with his grace and to act as a witness um, for him for love of others when maybe they are disappointing us in some way um, because we should be wanting um, to love others the way God loves them. And, and sometimes that's the hardest thing, but it's a beautiful prayer to ask the Lord, Lord, help me to see this person as you see them. Right. And sometimes it's just a matter. I mean, there's been times where I've thought, I am just done with this. I got to just forget this situation. And then I'll think, or this person, I've just had it. 
And then I'll think, well, you know, maybe just a small phone call or a text message or, you know, just a little note, like, we miss you. Please come back. You know, can we talk? Um, you know, do you want to discuss something? Sometimes just that little reaching out um, makes a huge difference. Um, and sometimes was, finding ways to include people. Yeah, yeah I, was, I was reading um, Jacques Philippe's um, Trust in God last night and it's one of the the books that I'm kind of praying my way through and in it he he was he was writing about um the importance of not judging others when they're suffering and when they're going through a difficult time and and to not approach their suffering with a spiritual arrogance or with platitudes and and I think when we can be less judgment, less judgmental about other people and, and what they're doing or saying or going through and simply try to love them, which doesn't mean uh, getting involved in their mess, right. which is a different thing, but, but rather approaching the relationship with an element of spiritual detachment that says, I'm going to love you because God created you to be loved. I, I'm not going to get caught up in your mess and I'm not going to gossip with you and I'm, I'm not going to, you know, go to that party and I'm not going to do this or that, but I'll answer the phone if you ever want to talk mm. and I'll be friendly and I'll pray for you. And if you want to have lunch sometime, mm. that's great. But to approach it with a bit of detachment where you're letting God lead the relationship as opposed to cutting yourself off and saying, no, Lord, I'm closing that door. Or getting overly involved and saying, I'm going to try to fix everything that's wrong with everyone around me. Right. No, right. that's not what we're asked to do usually. One of the things we talk about with um, young people when I was teaching at URI or co-teaching um, was the concept of, and it was an ethics class, the concept of holding on to what we call the valid picture of the other. So you, you meet someone and they're wonderful and you see that or you have a small child and they're wonderful and then they turn into this monster teenager or, you know, friendships that, you know, seem to turn around and, and the ability to hold on to that first valid picture, the good picture sure. of the other person um, to see them as God created them and to hold on to that through a difficult period of time. Um, to love them, you know, to will the good of the other through a difficult period of time. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, if a relationship is abusive, you have to step back from it yes. quite a bit. And so um, loving doesn't necessarily, doesn't mean you have to be a doormat or put yourself in harm's way. Um, but it does mean that sense of willing the good for the other and trying to find out where you fit in that picture. Absolutely. And sometimes it may just mean that you just pray for that person. Yes. Um, and if you can't do that, I've found that sometimes it means just handing them over in one prayer to God and stepping back. Um, yes. So that takes that, that integrity within yourself that you're talking about to discern, to have the prudence and to discern how we can help both ourselves and others. As yeah, best and that, we and can. That, that can only come through prayer. Yeah, yeah. So that's Lots what the, the grace, <laughs> prayer, prayer, the grace, the, the, the grace of the sacraments. Uh, absolutely. And, and really taking the time to, you know, last night after reading that, um, that bit, I, I just sat for a while and thought, okay, so with some of these relationships that maybe I've struggled with in the past, was there a part that I contributed to the difficulty. And, and really honestly exploring that because I think it's so easy to look at difficult relationships and, and think that it's all the other person. Right. But really, if, if you're gonna be a person of, an, person of an integrity, that means being open to your own weaknesses and failings and being able right. to say, okay, I wanna understand myself wholly and completely. Did I maybe? Get I had a wrong here. I had an interest, interesting situation about I don't know maybe five ten years ago with my sister. She was here at the house, and uh, we started looking through old pictures, and there were pictures of her 
with her children when they were really young. And I said to her, it's really funny, but like, I don't really remember you much back then when your kids were little. And she responded with, well, you were a real fill in the blank back then. Wow. And my first reaction, you know, was this inner anger, like, how dare you speak to me like that? <laughs> you know, I could say a few things myself. And, um, but I didn't react. I just listened. And I thought, well, that's, that's interesting that she said that. And then I started to think, I said, I just responded with like, oh, well, I'm, you know, glad things have improved since then. But then over the next few weeks after she left, I really thought about her response. And I started to think about, well, why don't I remember her with her children when they were little? Right. Like, where was I at during that time period? Um, obviously, I hadn't been being a very good sister to her um, because I don't remember the children when they were little. And, you know, it, it sort of, well, I was busy with my own children and they were little. Um, but it was interesting to me, rather than just react in anger to her statement, I just allowed myself to take it in and to pray about it and think about it, meditate on it. Um, who was I then? How have I changed since then? Um, and, and so her statement rather, which could have been like a big blow up family argument, um, wasn't, I, I just, I just listened to her and, um, I don't think I'd have reacted like that 20 years ago. If she said that, you well, know? that's, that's maturity and wisdom and, it, a lot but, of yeah, and prudence. It's, so it takes time to develop that and and with relationships with people to have prudent reactions mm -hmm. um, but like you were saying also to take a look at ourselves rather than saying oh no I was a wonderful person back then to be willing to look and say well maybe I wasn't you right. know maybe I wasn't such a great sister at, um, at that at that point in time um, and that that's, can be tough to do yeah. it, it can be um, it's a very necessary step, though, for growth in the spiritual life, because we, we need to be able to see how we've grown, and we need to be able to see where we still need to grow, and then invite God's grace into those spaces, so that um, with his help, we can grow, whether, whether we're 18 or 85. Now, at the same time, you say in the book, we don't want to dwell on our imperfections. No. So where is that balance? How do we find, what's that balance between looking at them, dealing with them, but not dwelling on them? Well, I, I think there's, there's an, a, a, an acceptance. I mean, that's, that's part of what real humility is, is being able to see ourselves completely to recognize that we're going to have weaknesses. Um, and, and to not make a big deal out of it, just to say, okay, this is something that I struggle with, but it's something that I want to get better at. Um, and, and, and I, I think that if we, if we are caught up too much in our weakness, then, then we're really not under understanding our, our very value or, or self-worth. And so you've got to have, you've got to have both. You've got to understand what you're doing well and where you need to grow. Um, I think one of the, one of the things that's helped me with that balance is each night, you know, doing the exam in and looking at the things that, you know, I should have done differently during the day first, but then finishing with, okay, how did I, how did I use my gifts for your glory today, Lord? How, how did, how did I, you know, I, I know the Lord doesn't have a, you know, a, a face and a smile like we do, but I like to think of like little things that made the Lord's heart smile. <clears throat> and that's just one of the like things in my head that I think about whether it's theologically correct or incorrect to say that <laughs> the Lord has a smile on his heart. But, uh, but, but, but I'll, I'll look at, at, at those. I was like, Lord, where, you know, where did I see you today? And where did I recognize you today? And, and to be able to um, do both of those things. 
it's important to do both of those things. It is. It is. So one of the things I saw in the book that I found was, I found of interest, it's one of the things that got written down as I went through it, was our crosses do not define us. Mm. So we all have suffering and in, in our suffering, we all get it. We all get a cross. Yes. Um, Jesus. I mean, we look at a cross every time we're at mass. We look at the crucifix. Um, so in some ways, our sufferings, I don't know if they define us, but they certainly affect who we are. Mm-hmm. Um, and we certainly in some level identify with them. And, and so we have this combination of, you know, as Catholics, we believe that suffering ha- can have meaning. Suffering in and of itself is not a good, but suffering that we can, redemptive suffering that we can um, join with Christ in mm-hmm. his suffering, that we can add that to it. Um, I mean, certainly my own life, when I look back on the things that have really made me suffer, they're the things that have helped me mostly grow the most as yes. a person. They've helped with my integrity. Um, some of them, you know, I really dragged around for quite a while. Um, <laughs> integrity came very slowly <laughs> in little dribs and drabs. But um, so your book addresses this idea of our of our suffering, um, that we want to accept it and welcome it. At the same time, we don't want to just completely identify with it. So, yeah, I actually, I, I think that this is a whole... I feel like I only scratch the surface in this book um, in terms of suffering. I've, I've done a, a, well, one podcast already on suffering. There's another one that's coming. Um, We've got a podcast on integrity, one on perfectionism, all all these things that keep coming up. I'm like, Oh, there's a podcast episode on that. (laughs) Um, And I'm, I'm prepping for my next podcast that'll be recording is on grief actually. And um, the suffering that comes with grief but uh, yeah, you're right. Suffering is suffering is a huge thing. Um, I think there's a whole book's worth of new information on suffering that I, I really want to share. But in terms of that that statement that I make that our, our crosses don't define us, I I think that there are times when suffering can be so overwhelming or so persistent that that's all we can see in ourselves. And and so when we think of who we are. Um, we are, for instance, a special needs mom, you know, the mom of a special needs child, I will be taking care of that child for my entire life. And so that is what I am. And everything that we do and say and think is done through that lens, because it is so all consuming. And so my argument is, rather than define ourselves as that, or as a widow, um, for instance, um, we define ourselves as God's daughter first. That, that is what defines us, is our relationship with him. And yes, those other um, crosses that we have in life, um, the loss of a loved one, um, maybe living a life that we didn't imagine we would be living um, in, in some way, shape, or form. That's um, most of us. <laughs> that's most of us, right? Um, being unmarried you know, older than we wanted to be. Um, those are real crosses, but they don't define who we are. And, and yes, they are going to shape and they are going to influence who we become. Um, I agree with you. One of, uh, you know, the, the most difficult times in my life, I mean, one of the most difficult times in my life was when uh, my husband and I lost a baby um, to miscarriage. And yet that was the catalyst for me becoming Catholic. And so in hindsight, we can sometimes look once we're through that process, through that, that, that time of grief and struggle and despair, and we can look at it and see the beauty that God brought out of it. It's very hard to do that when we're in the moment. And certainly when it is a, a chronic struggle, a struggle that we will probably live with for our life, which is really what I define the big crosses as, something that we will live with for our entire life. Right. But that's not all we are. That is part, that is, that, is, that is something that the Lord has allowed to happen um, for some reason we will never know, but he has allowed it to happen um, for some good. 
in this world. And so having that trust in him to say, I, I, I don't like this, Lord, being able to tell him, Lord, I don't like this. This is horrible. And to mm. he can take it. But, but then to turn and say, but I know you're allowing it. And so there must be a reason why. And I just can't see it. And, mm. and, and that's a beautiful way to embrace those, those, those crosses rather than just trying to, to hide it. Ditch it, leave it wherever you can. Run away from it. You mentioned that ability to be angry at God. Like, I don't like this. Um, And I've always said that, you know, being able to be angry at God (laughs) means you're in a relationship with God. If you couldn't, you know, I'm I'm one of these people during some very difficult times in my life have headed to the church Mm -hmm. and, you know, in an empty church and yelled at him in the tabernacle. Like, you know, take it. You keep doing this. You know, I'm mad at you. I, I'm hurt, I'm angry um, enough already. And, um, but that does imply an under a deeper trust that he is there. Absolutely. Um, and that he does care. Um, and like you said, that he can handle our anger. Um, and there are periods in our lives where that may be the only prayer we have at the time. Right. And that's okay too. Right. Keep saying the prayer. Right. Keep right. meeting him. Keep telling him how you feel and keep engaging in that relationship with him. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I've had crosses and you mentioned that you, you, you know, you will bear your entire life. Um, and I would have bet my life on that. And yet I no longer bear those crosses. Mm-hmm. He has taken them away. Um, I mean, if you'd asked me about certain crosses that I was carrying 15, 20 years ago, I would have said, well, I will carry this with me always. But I don't carry it today. Um, he's he's taken it. He's given me other crosses. <laughs> but, Swapped them um, out. But the worst ones he's taken, um, and I've been able to set them aside. Um, you know, there's. I don't know if you've ever heard. It's a story of a man who comes to the cross warehouse. You heard that, and Jesus is at the door. And he lugs his cross in and he says to Jesus, I've had it with this cross. I don't want this cross anymore. Jesus says, okay, we'll just set it aside and go in and pick a different one. (laughs) So the guy goes to the cross warehouse and there's big ones and, you know, and he goes around. He's in there for hours looking at all the different crosses. And he's like, no, I don't want that one. And then finally he sees this little tiny cross over in the corner. And he's like, oh, thank God, there's a little tiny cross. Mm-hmm. I want that one. Right. So he grabs that one and he drags it to the door. And he says, Jesus, this is the little cross that I want. I don't want any of those other horrible ones. And Jesus says, fine, take that one. That's the one you came in with. <sighs> so I, I, I always love that. Um, Many years ago, my first grandchild was born. Um, when he was about two months old, we realized that he wasn't breathing right. And um, long story short, he needed open heart surgery up at um, Boston Children's Hospital. And um, so he was going to be there for a week. He was, you know, two days before the open heart surgery and you know a week recovery and you know he was my first grandchild I was really we were really bemoaning our fate you know this was this was as horrible he weighed nine pounds he wasn't gaining weight he was this was my first little beloved grandchild Cameron and I was I was devastated and I just couldn't think of my daughter was carrying this cross we all were he was baptized like the day before we went up felt like it was just horrible. I mean, it was just horrible. And we got there. She was getting him checked in. And the, the men were all parking cars because we were going to be living there for a week. And I went into the waiting room of the ward where we were going to sort of be camping out for this week. And I sat down. And this this young woman was sitting there opposite me. And she said, so why are you here? And so I told her, I was like, you know, oh, it's just horrible. We're going to be here for a week. My my little baby beloved grandson needs open heart surgery. I mean, it was horrible. And so after she listened to me, um, I said, why are you here? And she said, she said, I live here. 
My son was born two years ago. He's had five open heart surgeries. He's received a heart transplant. He's received two lung transplants. He's got five more surgeries before we'll be able to go home. Wow. And I just was like, I walked out of that waiting room like, we're only here for a week. <laughs> you know? Hallelujah. I mean, it was like, I suddenly realized I had a cross that was this big. And this woman was carrying this monster cross. And I met, you know, mother after mother, father after father in that week that we were there that were carrying crosses that I could never carry. <laughs> there is not one of the crosses I've ever carried that I would trade for any of theirs. Um, it was quite an enlightening <laughs> week. It still makes me cry. And he's 16 now. Um, yeah, it was... Um, it was amazing. She said we, she lived there. She'd been living at Boston Children's Hospital for two and a half years. Surgery. And she was a happy person. And, you know, shared it with me. Um, so, um, which brings me to one of the things that you said about um, first a grateful heart, which I loved. Uh, we always ask in the ethics class, especially with the young people, can an can an ungrateful person be happy? And they're always fascinated because, you know, gratitude first. Absolutely. I, I, I did an episode on helping kids to become more grateful also. And that was one of the things that, that we discussed a lot about is that you've, gratitude comes before joy. You, you, it you does. You won't experience joy if, if you don't first have gratitude. And, and that was, that was something that I had to discover on my own. Um, I, it was actually through um, Anne Voskamp's book, A Thousand Gifts, that, that she, I, I, I credit her with the. <laughs> I haven't heard of that, A Thousand me, Gifts. A Thousand Gifts, with helping me to, to really realize that she has a, a in, in the book, she walks the reader through a process of daily writing down what you're grateful for keeping a gratitude journal mm -hmm. and it was through that process because I was seeking joy I was seeking joy at the time in my life I had <laughs> four little kids I, I <laughs> sort of felt you know stay-at-home mom um, not much going on in terms of uh, intellectual stimulation and at the same time I felt like I couldn't do anything right uh, I wanted to make my kids laugh every day. That was one of the things that I was seeking to make sure that they had a joy-filled childhood. But I didn't know how to do that. And, and so really coming to understand that it was gratitude that was going to, to be the answer. Looking at what you have and being truly grateful for it is, mm -hmm. is the answer to living a joy-filled life. Amen. Yeah. I love that and you have Sometimes gratitude is hard. When you're in suffering, um, but yeah, digging no for it, yeah, digging for it, you know, yeah. even if sometimes it's just the little things, I'm, I'm glad it's a nice day outside, even though I can't appreciate it, you know, just, uh, and you start to find those little nuggets of gratitude. We do, we do so something yours? for our kids growing um, around the table every night, we do a high-low, and so the high of what are you grateful for? that day and uh and the best part of your day and and then the low well i mean obviously it's the, the low and there are times in our in our family life where instead of doing high low my husband will just declare when we sit down just tell me what you're thankful for and typically if he does if he says that it means it's been a rough day around the house you know it's been one of those saturdays where like the kids are fighting and no one's doing their chores and we got to ask them 10,000 times to do a simple thing and you know we get to the end of the day and we're just glad that everybody's in one piece and instead of getting into the like what was the worst part about your day <laughs> or what was the best right. part about your day in which they usually will just look at dinner and be like dinner but which yeah. basically means my day was horrible but thank horrible. you for making everybody dinner. was a jerk and that's exactly. horrible yeah so, so the um the what are you thankful for and and I think for anybody who lives with anybody else 
and shares meals with them. Just starting with that, when you sit down for, for a meal, hey, what are you thankful for? It doesn't have to be only something that we do on Thanksgiving, which you know, it is something that we do at Thanksgiving. We go around and say what, what we're thankful for, but it doesn't have to be reserved just for Thanksgiving. It can be any day of the, any day of the year. What are you thankful for? Right. And it does help redirect your attitude, your vision. You're thinking. You can find something. Yeah. 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 It kind of softens things a little bit. If you, even if you can find one thing, you know, I'm grateful for the dog, you know, something. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know. And it gives a little, it, it, uh, gives a little insight to the other, the way the other person thinks too. Yeah. It's and, also very difficult or almost impossible to feel grateful and feel angry at the same time. One kind of pushes the other out. It's a, it's a huge, uh, we call it an antidote to, um, I think the, uh, the Dalai Lama called it an antidote to sadness and to anger is mm -hmm. gratitude. Believe yeah. that? Yeah, definitely. So who who do you see as your audience for the book? I mean, you were very, first I meant to mention you were very brave in self-publishing it. How, how was that experience for you? Uh, it was hard. <laughs> It was really hard. There's still things that I'm trying to figure out. Uh, for instance, I got it on Amazon in time for Cyber Monday. I was so excited because I've got people in Australia and Denmark and England and Ghana and Kenya who've been trying to order the book. And I, I, I'm not shipping internationally because, so I'm, I'm selling it through my own website, maryruthhackett.com and offering free shipping just like Amazon. So if any, because I know people don't like to pay for shipping now, but no, I don't, don't have it set up to take international currency. So I had mm -hmm. someone in, you know, in, in um, Canada who wanted to buy 10 copies. And I was like, I don't, I don't even know how you can pay me from Canada. So I'm trying to figure that out. I decided, okay, we're going to put it on Amazon. Then it can ship anywhere. That'll be great. Well, then this morning I found out you know, someone in Australia sent me an email that said, it says it's it's unavailable and out of stock in Australia. I don't know what to do. I'm like, I I, I don't know what to do either because I'm just doing this on my own. I'm trying to figure it out. So a lot of YouTube videos. Um, I have a consultant that I'm working with who's answering a lot of questions for me wow. and, and helping with those sorts of things. But it's been exciting because I had free reign. Um, I hired copy editors and line editors. I've been writing online um, with Blessed Is She and with spiritualdirection.com. Um, I mean, with Blessed Is She for eight years now since they started. And so I know editors. I know other writers. I know people who have done this before. So I've had a lot of support from um, the Catholic community online. And that's how I was able to find my copy editor and to find, um, find a line editor through the diocese. The diocese of Phoenix has been wonderfully supportive of, of me and my project as well. That's where I have my podcast, um, parenting smarts podcast is through the diocese of Phoenix. And so they've been a great resource also to help get out the word a little bit about the book. The reality is that with, with publishers now, you have to do all the work yourself anyhow as an author. They will have people who will do your copy edits and your line edits, just like I hired a copy editor and a line editor. I just happened to hire a copy editor that I knew, that I loved, who, who um, I already had a relationship with, and who knew me really well. And so she was able to say, Mary Ruth, I want this, I want your voice captured more in this, in this book. I want more of you, and I want less, less of the academic. And so she is the one who helped me to achieve a really great balance of the, the personal stories, the interesting, the practical stuff, with also that academic or the theological. So it, it brings all three of those, the academic, the theological, and, and the personal together. So I loved working as a team um, with these other people, but I was able to bring them together. Um, and then Faith Family. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah, Faith Family Publications is the one that's been... Um, that I hired as a consultant to kind of help walk me through there. Mike over there has just been fantastic. He's got 25 years in, in um, the business. So he's helped, he navigated things for me with the printer and knowing, you know, 
trim sizes and all of those things that I just, I just wouldn't know otherwise. So the self-publishing has been wild. It's been super, <laughs> super wild. I would say I'm about six, it was about six months ago, maybe that we just, we started the self-publishing part of it all. I, I had the book written and just, then I didn't know what to do with it. Um, mm -hmm. But they, they've been, they, my team was wonderful. Really, awesome. really wonderful. Having a good yeah. editor is, you know, worth their weight in gold. I mean, I've been both an editor and an, I'm an author. And yeah. um, the the editing thing, like you're saying, you really ha someone who can help you find your voice um, is so yeah. important. I had a situation years ago. I had helped edit when I was in college. I had helped my friend Stephen Schwartz edit his book. Um, what was it called? The Moral Question of Abortion. Mm. So it was almost goodness, close to 40 years ago, he wrote that book. And then 25, 30 years later, um, it was now out of print and the, a publisher got in touch with him and said, we'd like to re, you know, republish this book for you. So he handed the book to me and he said, um, they want me to revamp the book. And by now I was working with him at the University of Rhode Island and we were doing the abortion issue together in the ethics class for a good five, seven years at that point. So I just started flipping through the book, which was, you know, like I said, almost 30 years old at this point. Yeah. And I said to him, you know, this was a great book, Steve, when you wrote it, but you would never write this book today in this same way. I said, because it was a very religious Catholic <clears throat> book. It was a Catholic book. But obviously, we weren't teaching the abortion issue in any kind of Catholic way in the classroom. Right. Um, but we were having great success in the classroom. He always had. I said, why don't we write the, why don't you rewrite the book the way you teach it now? Yes. And he said, you know, that was a great idea. So yeah. we, it was the second book, Understanding Abortion. Um, was done the way we did it in the classroom, and it's radically different from the first book. First of all, it doesn't take a stand. It simply presents the two sides. It was a totally different book. Um, and then I said to him, you know, you, as a man, you can't write this book. You have to find a woman to write it with you because of the, the topic. Mm -hmm. um, so I said, I don't care who you pick, but find somebody. And so he said, you're, well, okay, here you are. You know, <laughs> so we wound up writing it together. Um, and it was, it was wonderful. Um, but it took my having to say, you know, this isn't who you are anymore. This isn't the same voice you would write with. So your editor being able to say to you, you know, you need to bring in more of your personal voice mm. into this because it's a very personal book. Um, yes. that's, that's just, you know, wonderful to have that. I, I'm lucky that I'm a speaker and then I have the podcast because otherwise I'm not sure how I would actually even really sell the book, sell the book quite honestly, um, because I'm, I am still out there. So, so that, that's very helpful from the self-publishing standpoint, but even when you publish with a, with a publisher, it can, that's still something that you as an author are responsible for kind of going out and getting right. the gigs and meeting people and shaking hands and selling the books. So right. that's the hard part. <laughs> that is the hard part. That is very yeah. hard. I can sit in a room for five or six hours and just write, I would love to do that. Well, if my family life let me do that, I would love to do that. But when, you, when you're a writer and you actually want to sell your books, you've got to do more than just write them. That, that's right. a whole other, that's whole other process. Yeah. So you are still a stay-at-home mom. You have yes, how many am. children? You have I, I, have, I have four kids. They are 10. 14, 16, and 19. So my 19-year-old is in college. He's, uh, he, I live in Arizona uh, with the three kids and my husband. And our 19-year-old is in school in Iowa. He goes to Central College in Pella, Iowa. Okay. So we so started launching them out of the nest. <laughs> so you're still in the thick of it. Wow. <laughs> I had four children this homeschooling and um, now I have 13 grandchildren. So Oh, that's beautiful. Um, so I'm busy and they're all pretty close. So, um, yeah, so I'm, I'm busy also between writing and Wonder. this is fun and uh, reading books and, um, you know, just life gets very, very busy. You it know, doesn't I, I used to think once my kids were gone that I would be less busy, um, but I'm actually almost more busy 
than I ever was. Yeah. And less energy. <laughs> yeah. So I had to laugh when you mentioned a stay at home mom that some people call it a paycheck. What'd you say? A paycheck sitting at home. A paycheck sitting at home. <laughs> you know, that didn't go over well with uh, my husband or I when he, when he heard that. I, my, my sister went said to me, she said, well, you homeschool and that's free. <clears throat> and I, I really had to laugh. I said, no, it's not free. It's my entire paycheck that I would be making if I were out working in the world. Um, so whatever I would be making, that's what it costs us to homeschool. And she had just never thought of it like that. You know, it's fascinating. Yeah, we, we, we had an interesting, um, kind of understanding of that when we looked at life insurance and our kids, our kids were little and we were trying to decide how much we should insure my husband and I both for, he realized that he needed to insure me for just as much, if not more than he was insuring himself. Because if something happened to me, he was going to have to hire someone to do all of the things that I was doing. And yeah. that was much more expensive <laughs> then maybe he would have realized initially. Yeah. Yeah. But it kind of put that dollar sign to the work that I was doing in the home, which which was interesting for both of us. I mean, he's always been supportive of me being a stay-at-home mom and yeah. um, supportive of me doing a podcast and speaking and book writing and everything else. He's, he's my biggest cheerleader. Uh, but it was really interesting for us to really put a dollar in a sense. To, okay, well, how much would it cost to have daycare? or a nanny for the four kids and how much would it cost to hire someone to, you know, to do the meals differently and how much would it, because he was, you know, he works a lot of long hours mm -hmm. um, and it was a lot of money. Yeah. Stay mm -hmm. home moms. We don't, we don't give ourselves enough, uh, enough credit, although it's changing. It's a lot better now than it was, I think 20 years ago. I think so too. Yeah. And there's more people. Are you homeschooling? Are you? I am not. I've, I have. At various time, homeschooled uh, three out of the four kids. Um, if if family circumstances, you know, yeah. Was, yeah, if, we were, if it was the best situation for the child at yeah. the time, then I, I I did it for for a couple of the kids. Um, oh. But no, they we have a wonderful parish school. Oh, nice! <laughs> and, yeah, and so so all all of the kids went to uh, did their primary years at the parish school, and then Arizona is a charter school state, and we've got a wonderful charter school. Uh, for junior high and high school that that my nice. kids um, have have really done done well at so yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that was not an option here in Rhode Island at the time <laughs> um, I don't think it, it isn't now either you know, especially southern Rhode Island is quite rural so we did homeschool we you know back, we were homeschooling when nobody was homeschooling you know we were sort of the pioneers putting it on the map and uh, trying to to do it and do it well um, and it's been, it was great. It was great. We loved it. And I've got, um, one of my daughters is homeschooling now. So oh, that's beautiful. Yeah. I, I love it when we see things that <laughs> transfer down generationally, because it, it's almost, I see it like a, just a little validation that like, okay, that was a really good thing for her to, for you to do with that child, because they now right. want to do that with their own children. I think that's beautiful. Mm -hmm. So is there anything that's really important to you about the book that we have that you would like to mention? I don't want you to like anything that we haven't covered. There's so much in the book and it's wonderful. It's a great retreat book. Um, Thank you. Well, I'll show it. Yes. There it is. Daughter by Design. It's not super, not super big. Like we talked about, it's kind of small. And then inside there are lines to write. So you can just journal in the book itself. There is an online version as well. If you're a Kindle lover and you've got your own little journal that you like writing in, you can you can go to my website and you can download it. Um, I also have an online study guide that's free. So if you're thinking maybe you want it, you're not quite sort of sure what sorts of questions are in there. The online study guide has a bunch of that information. So you can just download the online study guide and kind of peruse the questions and see what sort of thing are there. That's free. Um, and then it just, it makes a great group study too. So if you've got some women that want to get together and travel through Advent together um, and, um, or Lent together or life together. Uh, <laughs> I think that's a great idea. I think it would make a wonderful group study book. Yeah. 
And that's it. So it's at maryruthhackett.com. Um, Do you have another book in the wings? I've got a couple. I've got a couple. Yeah. So I I have been writing one on virtue, um, and and that is in the works. And then I've got another one that's sort of based off of a lot of the podcast topics. I've got about seventy episodes now for the Parenting Smarts podcast, and so I'm sort of culling some of that content and putting it together into a like a mind body soul book. So we'll see. I've got those two sort of in the works, and. Um, the Lord's just put on my heart to maybe write something about suffering. So I don't know what the order of things will go, um, how everything will go um, as, as those come out. We'll see. I'm curious, will you try to self-publish again or would you go, would you ship it off to Sebastian and say, take a look at this? I mean, <laughs> Sebastian is pretty amazing. So, uh, so I, amazing. I don't know, but the self-publishing was such a great experience and to be able to self-publish the first time and to have such success, I mean, people are loving the book. I think if I had self-published and only sold, you know, 100, 100 or 200 copies, I'd look and be like, oh, I don't know. Maybe I just don't know what I'm doing. Um, but I mean, it's, it's I'm, I'm having to reorder. This is the third time I've had to reorder books. So it's... That's exciting. People are, people are loving it, which is giving me a little more confidence to say, I don't know, maybe I had to just self-publish again. So I don't know. <laughs> I, we'll I'm see. curious. Yeah, we'll see. It, being an, being a um, stay-at-home mom slash academic, I don't know, maybe I could call myself a scholar stay-at-home mom. Uh, <laughs> it is a good fit for Sebastian and, and his, uh, his house and, the, and the, um, his, his publishing work. So we'll see. Yeah, he is amazing. He's wonderful. Yeah. You want to end us with prayer, please? Yes, thank you. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Lord, for this time together. Thank you for inspiring us, each individually and collectively as a group. Lord, we ask that, that your words remain with us in our hearts, and that if there's anything that we've discussed today, Lord, that you want specific listeners to just hear and to ponder that you'll bring it to mind for them, Lord, so that they can continue to grow in that particular area. We thank you for Kiki. Lord, we ask healing upon all of our families. Amen. In the name of the Amen. Father. Spirit. Thank you. Thank you again. Been awesome. Amen. Stay in touch. I'm going to get a copy of it. Excellent. Oh, and again, you. how do we order copies? You can order at maryruthhackett.com. If you Ruth want Hackett. to try to order from Amazon, absolutely, you can order it from Amazon too. Uh, as long as you live in the United States, I know it'll work. Uh, but email me if it doesn't work. You can. There's a contact form on my website. If for some reason you try to order it from Amazon and it doesn't work, let me know. I think it'll work internationally, sorry, nationally, just in the US, for Amazon for sure though. So give that a try. Contact me if it doesn't work and I'll try to troubleshoot it. You know, just figuring this out as I go along. <laughs> Sounds good. Thank you so much. Thank Mary you, Ruth. It's been wonderful. And continued luck with the book and with your podcast. Thank you very okay. much. Very much. Thank you. Have a good day. You too.